Good morning, everybody. It's Gil here with Dr. K. Uh, coming at you on a nice uh, rainy Thursday, Monday, or Thursday morning uh, uh, here in uh, Playa del Rey, California. Anyways, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Good morning, good morning. Yes, okay, very good. That's all I need to know. Um, as you guys probably know already, there was a buy signal on the market direction model this morning, and uh, I'm sure everybody ran out and immediately shorted the market on that buy signal. So um, probably uh, uh, maybe the wrong thing to do. All I know is this. I can tell you my own experience. I like if the market gets weak, one of the things I like to do is come after some stocks in the short side. And so you can do that. And the, the thing you have to do is remain open-minded about what you're doing because what you're doing is you're testing the short side. And, you know, we tried to short F5. And I notice every time it comes down to one two seven one two eight, it, it's holding. It's holding the fifty day, and you can see the bid in there. And so you know the stock's being bought every time it comes down. So a lot of times, if I get stopped out real quick on that, or if I just perceive that, I'll turn right around and go long the stock. And I think uh, that's something to look at here. But I'll get to that right now. What you know is we have a buy signal on the market direction model. Uh, Dr. K, what uh, is the basis for the buy signal? Uh, the basis is uh, enough. Well, first of all, we had a. Uh, not, no, wait, I just want to make one thing sure. It's, it's not because IBD went to uh, market in uptrend. <laughs> yeah, there, uh, despite IBD, uh, the model has gone up to boxing. Oh, do I detect some arrogance there? All right. Um, in any case, no, I, okay. I, I, I've, always, I've always said actually the big picture column is one of the, the, the last men standing when it comes to timing models. I mean, most of them in, it, were knocked out. Um, uh, been knocked out, you know, since since Kiwi started in 2009, um, and you know the big picture still it's still one of the few that are you know worth worth discussion. But that said, um, uh, the model went to buy signal on the basis of the S and P 500 because and on the basis of leading uh, stock action by Apple and a number of other leaders. Um, we as as people know, we uh, track the S and P 500 and the Nasdaq Composite for potential follow through day signals, and we did make a follow through day. Uh, the S&P had cleared its threshold level yesterday um, by being up, uh, I think it was up about 1.4 percent. So it's just barely cleared it. Okay. <clears throat> so you're on a buy signal. That's all you know. Uh, the, the flip side of this and something I've been talking about in previous uh, webinars is that uh, on the short side I look around for short sale setups and you know I'm, I'm kind of stretching it if you think about it. If you're trying to go after something like an F5 as uh, something I call a viable gap up inversion. I, what I've noticed is that there may be so, a way to short viable gap ups that are late stage because a lot of times the things will fail and drop out below the, the intraday low of the gap up day like we saw F5 do. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Um, like we saw F5 do. Whoops. I don't even think that's, uh, that's the right template there. That's a NASDAQ. Let's go here. Is this chart. So, you know, we saw uh, you saw this breakdown, but you notice the volume dries up, and it's trying to get through the 50-day, and it gets drops below it a couple of times. But I notice each time it does that, it seems to uh, pick up some support. And you saw some volume yesterday uh, on this uh, move back above uh, the 50-day moving average. So to me, I thought with the volume picking up and the stock moving above the 50-day moving average, if you're not getting stopped out at 130, which is a really tight stop, you're probably just covering on the basis of that kind of technical action. That's something you have to keep an eye on. Now I'm wondering whether uh, the stock will try and move out of here uh, based on the fact that you had a viable gap up because you did not reverse hard because usually what you'll see, and, and you can go back and look at some failed gap ups. I think there are some uh, in uh, stocks like Acme Packet, I think at one time had some gap ups. And usually what happens is they break down and they get hammered on huge volume. You didn't really see that happen here and the volume does pick up you get back above the 50 day. So I'm kind of looking at this as a cautious long or something to, to possibly move into uh, on the long side, because the networking area looks pretty strong, and the uh, you know cloud computing is still a pretty uh, pretty viable. You have this, you know, and this kind of stuff will drive you absolutely nuts. You, stock breaks out, and then it fails, and then it violates. Uh, does it ever violate the 50-day moving average, Dr. K? It's hard to say. It looks like yeah, it does. might somewhere in here. It, lo it looks like that. Uh, it's just right when it pierced it, and then it closed below, and then uh, broke below the low that closed. Yeah, okay, and so then the thing, you know, they come out with their things and the thing gaps up and it's out of here. And uh, that sort of thing drives you nuts. Yeah, and I mean, it, it violates the 50-day readily uh, along the way, and that makes it very challenging as a stock to uh, to stay uh, stay in this thing long term. 
Yeah, so that so but you know here you have a Bible gap up. It's coming out of a base now. Um, I, I guess if you caught it somewhere in here, you're doing okay. This is kind of extended now. So you know if you're buying up here, that could be a little bit problematic. Yeah, we sent out the report when it was only up. Uh, well, it, it was it hadn't really been making much of a you know it had gapped up. You can see where it opened close to the low, and then we sent the report shortly after. So anyone who bought it on the report uh, should be up a uh, you know I don't know two or three few percent on this. Yeah, thing. you might be up. Yeah. Yeah, another one that was moving was Citrix, and uh, that gapped up as well. Uh, I don't think here's a violation on the 50-day here, but it comes right back up, reverses. This is not a violation here, and now you gap up. Now this is could be considered viable. Um, you know, actually we're using their system uh, right now. Go to webinar. So they seem to be doing okay. Their earnings report came out uh, very strong. You get a viable gap up. So you're seeing some breakouts and some gap ups and moves in stocks. Uh, across the board, there are some others. I think uh, Equix is another one. We uh, is that right? Yeah, EQIX. There's a viable gap up there. It's coming off of a sort of a flag pattern here, so we'll see if this works. But it's still within range. It's not really too far out there. Um, let's, let's look at some others. I noticed that, you know there's some other stocks. This Timken. Uh, I think this is just a steel company. Metal process and fabrication, and that's a viable gap up there. But it's interesting how you're seeing some of that in uh, stuff stocks. You know, you're seeing Rockwood Holdings is a uh, chemical. I think there were a couple others that were doing pretty well uh, today and, and acting pretty well. So you might be seeing some rotation. Whenever you see a market correction, one thing you want to look for as a sign that the market may be coming out or may try to come out is you'll see some you'll see some leaders fall by the wayside. And I know several of you are asking. The question, you know, wow, we've seen these leaders breaking down. Panera Bread, but Panera Bread has come back up. Uh, CMG got hit. Yeah, uh, Ulta Salons got hit. Yeah, you know, there's going to be a few that fall by the wayside, and that's part of the rotational process. So what you want to see, if you see some leaders start uh, getting knocked down, you want to see some things rising and breaking out to take their place, and so you get this situation where you have a healthy rotation, and that's really what starts the second leg. Uh, of a bull market. So if you assume we've been in a bull run since January or late December really uh, in an uptrend and you are going sideways in really the first significant intermediate correction we've seen since January or since December rather, uh, you know, then you're in a position to correct and so you will see new leaders pop up, existing leaders will come out of second stage bases and so I'm looking around the past few days, you know, what's what's holding up as the market is correcting and you know a couple of things that caught my eye was Seagate Technology had a gap up here, uh, and then is it just ignored the market's pullback and it's continuing to make highs. Very strong fundamentals. It has a a cousin, and I know some people were uh, wondering why I like this one, uh, but it's going higher. Western Digital is also in the the disk drive business, but notice how here it comes out and it breaks out and then it pulls back and it actually violates the 50-day right here. Uh, and uh, and then turns around and moves higher. But if you think about this, you kind of got to give this a little bit of context. Let me see if I can find a weekly chart somewhere around here. I think I'm going to get rid of this S&P chart. We can see you have the follow through day. You're trying to come out of this range and you never undercut the low. So I'm just going to hurl that one out of here. And I think I'll hurl my NASDAQ chart. Let's see. NASDAQ in a different position. You're actually, hey, Dr. Che, what day of a rally? Our two day rally since we closed up at the low here? So yeah, I was you thinking you, you, you tried to rally up off the lows on this day. So I'm actually looking at this as potentially one, two, three, four, or you could say it's the third day of a rally attempt. Really, yeah, I mean by by the uh, by the basis of, of how I, I use it on my uh, model, uh, we're on the third day. In other words, if the market, if the major indice keeps declining, you don't start the count until you, you, you see the first day of stabilization, and that was that would be on the twenty uh, fourth. So, uh, you know, two days ago. So we're on that the third be, day right So now. we're on the third day. So then that means you might set up for a follow-through day uh, but, but I'd also point out that um, that I've noticed that, see, the NASDAQ, if it, if it only declines 6% or less, you don't stop. It doesn't reset the count. In other words, on that basis, yesterday could have been taken as a follow-through day on the NASDAQ. That said, um, from peak to trough, the NASDAQ was off, was off just, just a little over 6%. Right. Um, but it, it, it was no uh, no issue because the S and P um, you know more 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 than uh, covered covered the follow follow through right. day um, requirement. 
Right, and I think right now, uh, based on the overall evidence, I think you have to lean towards more bullish than bearish. I mean, but it doesn't mean bullish is going to be this incredibly profitable uh, market run that's going to ensue here, but we may do this QE grind where you just continue higher and you basically just have to be long the market. So uh, I think if you're long, uh, we're using the TQQQ right now uh, and the QLD is our ETFs to uh, ride, hopefully if this comes out and the follow through day works. Uh, yeah, Dr. three what times, is that? times the, uh, the NASDAQ 100. And right, since Apple is the uh, leading stock, uh, the NASDAQ 100, I, you know, in ideally should outperform um, and small caps should continue to lag. Right. Now let's see, I'm looking for a weekly chart. I know I have one somewhere around here. Where did I put it? Let's see. Give me a sec here. Here we go. Nope, that's not it. Now the other thing I wanted to point out was uh, since 2009 um, in this age of uh, quantitative easing, of course <clears throat> QE has thrown off a lot of indicators which is why most timing systems, well the, I should say the few that were still left standing have been more or less knocked out um, and by that I mean they've, they've quite severely underperformed the market since 2009. Um, what makes it challenging is that when you're in leading stocks and the market has a small drop and, and the market has many times since 2009 had these small little corrections where it corrects between 5 to 8 percent. At that point it looks like everything, all hell is going to break loose and these leading stocks get hit very hard. So if you're in these leading stocks and you have to sell them out for a loss or you get scared of the position because they hit your sell stop and, and rightfully so, you should be selling at that point if, if your sell stop is hit and then the market turns right back around and goes higher, it drifts higher on maybe low or unconvincing volume but that, that's the nature of the QE beast. And uh, in the last uh, three years, there's only been two instances where the market really had uh, serious corrections, and that was May 2010, that was a flash crash, and then August of 2011. And other than that, every single correction the, the market's had has been short-lived and, and minimal, but just enough to knock, knock down the uh, leaders um, to, into where they're you know, maybe violating their 50-day moving average, thus forcing you out of your position. And of course, 2009, we all know that was a junk-led rally. Um, I think 2000, uh, late 2010 was the, was a, uh, a good bona fide rally from September into the end of the year. That was that was one window of opportunity we've had. This year, I would not call uh, the market action a window of opportunity simply because it's been almost a one stock rally led by Apple, and a lot of the other leaders haven't really made big moves. I mean, there's just a handful. So in other words, the risk reward equation is is uh, not on your side to trying to play the long side of this market. That doesn't mean that it can't uh, improve, I think, and we'll see how this goes. A lot of times I would have to say that in my career, uh, I usually, the first leg of a bull market I tend to flail around a lot and it's not, I don't really draw a beat on anything until the second leg. And so if this is the second leg, this is actually where I tend to make more money and you tend to get better moves off the second stage base. But that said, uh, we'll just see where this goes. But where I, where I was going before we got sidetracked a little bit is that when you look at something like a WDC, it's coming out of this major big structure. It's a big double bottom, okay, and you're coming out the top here. So as it just starts to emerge from here, you kind of have to, and this is one reason you always have to look at uh, weekly charts in conjunction with your daily charts, okay, because you can see Western Digital has got great numbers uh, trying to break out, and when it comes out of here, this little handle is probably too short. It almost looks pod-like, but I wouldn't make any assumptions about that mainly because uh, I don't think you're in a shorting environment. I know there are several questions coming in uh, on the uh, IMs here on, on the uh, go to webinar uh, window here asking, you know, what do I short this? Can we short this? Can we short that? I, I wouldn't be shorting the market here. I don't really see it set up here. If it if there is a time to short it out, that'll come. But I think first you're going to have to see a lot more short sale setups emerge in this market. But getting back to Western Digital, this is a weekly chart and you can see you're coming out of this big pattern. It extends all the way back to January of 2010. So it makes sense that you're going to halt a little bit here and then you come out, you back down, shake everybody out and then you turn around and go higher. So this actually looks okay to me, but let's consider which one is stronger. I think Seagate is, and Seagate's an old name, uh, you know, disk drives. They go back way, way back, and Seagate has had big moves in the past uh, based on its position as a leading uh, hard drive uh, producer or maker of hard drives. And you can see uh, Seagate's already come out of its big pattern. So here's the big base that it came out of. 
and it broke out here and ran up, and now you're in a second stage base. So I would say Seagate is uh, the stronger of the two. Right now, we see Western Digital up here is, is rallying on the day, uh, whereas uh, Seagate is just holding tight. And uh, I guess if it pulled back into the 10 day moving average, I'd probably be adding to my position here. But the breakout occurred on a gap up here, and then it basically just ignored. The market uh, pullback, and to me, when you see stocks doing it, that's probably your go-to area uh, if the market starts to firm up and, and you want to start looking at the long side. I know the tendency might be to look at leading stocks that have pulled back and are acting weakly, but I think those stocks that acted very strong while the market was correcting are probably the ones that will want to go higher anyways. And once you lift the weight of the market, they tend to move faster. So, you know, there is that tendency to want to. Uh, buy something that looks like it's further down in its pattern, but I'm looking for strength uh, that's within a viable range. And so I think Seagate is extended now from the breakout at around 28 and change, and uh, any kind of pullback to 30 would bring it back into range, and I would be uh, adding to my position there, I think, although you know, it may just continue to go higher from here. Uh, and if it does, I may just add on that basis as well. But I, also Western Digital looks okay, uh, and that's fine. Um, other stocks that we're looking at, the oils, you know, I, I'm looking at rotation here, and one thing I notice is that a lot of the oils were basing while the market was correcting, and they've really been basing for a period of time after having some strong moves up. I've always liked Continental Resources. Yesterday I had a little pocket pivot as it comes off the 10-day and just barely up through the 50-day moving average. It's continuing that move today. You're also seeing some of the other leading oil stocks trying to come off the right side. Pioneer uh, Natural Resources, another one had a pocket pivot yesterday. Uh, you know, we don't necessarily like to play oils because they don't have these coherent moves. The only time they really did was in 1997. And uh, I remember playing a couple oils and doing pretty well. I remember Cliss Drilling was a big one at the time. Uh, I wonder where they went. Uh, but in any case, we're, I'm noticing this, and I wonder if that just argues for the potential for stuff stocks to start coming on. You know, I was showing you the TKR Timken, uh, which is a metal process fabrication company, and there's there's a nice viable gap up. But uh, you also see consult CF Industries, which I was thinking might have been a short, but really there's something I missed here that I should point out, and that is you see these breaks below the 50-day moving average all along here. Let me draw a trend line along this. You notice each time it comes down, what's happening? The volume is kind of drying up on the sell side, and then you click up on this. I think the stock may, could go higher. The other thing to note here is that as the market was chopping around, uh, CF got pretty tight. And you have some tight closes along here, three weeks of tight closes to be exact here, and you might even say four out of five right in here. You might even say five out of six if you want to throw this week in here. But you can see that's very tight. This is a sloppy pattern, but I think these pullbacks, one, two, and then you have three shakes to the downside, and these pullbacks actually uh, just clean out weak holders, I think, and set up the potential for the stock to go higher. So that's what I'm looking at. I know yesterday there was some news from Mosaic. They were saying that they see an acceleration in fertilizer demand, um, but I would go, you know, they didn't really move, but I think CF is probably your better, your better target. But I'm noticing some of that occurring in... Uh, what you might call these stuff stocks. Maybe not a lot of it. I know everybody wants to short cat. Um, I don't think I'd be shorting cat here. That's a pretty good hit on earnings, but it could be a one-day wonder and then the stock tries to set up in a base. Uh, and it had a very sharp move up, so it makes sense that it would possibly build a base. But I gotta think if we're gonna if the market's gonna try to continue higher, you're gonna see cat stabilize. So I'm definitely not interested in shorting that. I'm not interested in shorting Ulta. I know everybody asks about short Ulta here. No, because it's in an uptrend. It just broke in the 50-day for the first time, and it has not technically has not violated it surprisingly. So uh, that's not a shortable pattern either. And when I talk about shortable patterns, I mean heads and shoulders or late-stage failed bases that are really starting to pan out and uh, produce some downside break uh, breakdowns. And you're not really seeing any of that at all. So to me, it seems dicey. Maybe it happens later. Yes, I know we're in the third year of a bull market, but nobody ever tells you exactly when the market's going to top. So just because we just crossed the three-year mark on a bull market, I don't think that that means that the market is in danger of imminently uh, or imminent danger of topping. So I wouldn't make that assumption at all. In fact, I think it would be a very foolish assumption just to assume that the market's in a bad spot based on that rule. I think in the age of QE, a lot of those standard bromides about the market sell in May and go away um, 
Uh, what are any got any others, Dr. K, that you can think of? Uh, but you know, the, the the other one being the three years of a bull market, it's time for the stock, the thing to top. That may or may not be the case. Um, bull markets well, can have their corrections. Those, those bromides don't have statistics. I mean, they have mild st statistical relevance, so they become these bromides. But if you try trading on them, um, you know, let's say a bromide is it works sixty percent of the time. That means forty percent of the time it doesn't. So it's kind of silly to to use any of those things uh, in your trading. Yeah, and uh, and another thing is that somebody makes a good point here, and, and this also is figures into my thinking as well, is that uh, last year you know you had a twenty percent correction in the markets here, it's like nineteen twenty percent. Would that qualify for a bear market? So that you were able to clear the decks in here, and that set up this move. And now what you're doing is you're a little fresher in that regard, and this is going to be another another leg when it comes out. And you know if it's going to work, you're still kind of early in the game here. But to me. Uh, that's where I'd rather be playing right now, and Dr. K and I both agree on that. And yes, th it is true that uh, the uh, the 20 or 19, I think it was a 90 percent correction. Was it, Dr. K? What was that? Well, from peak to trough on the Nasdaq, it was actually uh, just over 20 percent, 20.4 percent. 20 percent is bear market territory. So then you could say that you know there was sufficient bear market to. And uh, if you look at the S and P. The S and P was actually off more. It was off twenty one point six percent from peak to trough. That's intraday yeah. peak to intraday trough. Yeah. So that's a very good point made uh, made by Michael there. Thank you, on that, Michael, for bringing that to our attention and reminding us that that's something we're looking at as well in terms of how fresh is this uh, this bull run or this bull bull phase that we had starting really started in uh, you could say back off the lows of early October, but really where it became tight was. <laughs> So uh, that's something else to look at. So again, you know, you cannot make assumptions about the market based on bromides and based on these sort of knee-jerk rules that people want to apply. Um, somebody says here, Gil, can you comment on the pickup of larger moves of volatility on stocks, EPS announcements? Is this more a sign of a late of being late in the bull cycle? Well, I think our previous answer speaks to that. Uh, Dr. K, is it possible that Apple can have too much influence on the MDM given its size, or does the MDM account for this? Well, we wrote an article on this, and I'm assuming that I would assume that you know whether Apple has uh, too much influence on the index is neither here nor there. If it does, then you realize that if you're playing the Nasdaq index, you are playing Apple as well as a number of other big uh, stocks. What's your take on that, Dr. K? Is yeah, Apple's Influence. We're, we're in it. We're in an environment, um, as as we wrote in this article, that's um, that's been published on a number of websites about how it's become sort of a one stock market where Apple has undue influence on the rest of the market. It has, certainly has a lot of influence on the Nasdaq 100. It's weighed. Uh, I think its weighting is about 17 percent, but it also has indirect influence on other major tech stocks. So when Apple does well, institutions also will buy up these other stocks. So it, it, it it's uh, it's like follow the leader. And yeah. um, and it's had this effect actually much more so now than it's ever had before. The turnover rate on Apple is twice now what it was uh, three months ago, um, which is a hundred hundred times turnover rate versus fifty times turnover rate. And that's an incredible amount of dollars that that are flowing into and out of Apple by institutions. So this is a very <clears throat> unusual environment, and a one stock environment, of course, is more risky because you you know cor highly correlated environments are going to be riskier environments. Um, less places to hide, so to speak, um, and also you know more influence from one stock that also creates for more more risk and more volatility in the markets. But right. that said, Apple has had some very you know it's had a great uptrend this year, and uh, when it gets going, it, it tends to it tends to lead the market. So you know you don't want to get caught um, not being not being on the long side of the market as as concerns the MDM. Right, and and just coming getting to Apple, which always has a lot of questions. This stock finally had a great move. And finally, violated its 10-day moving average. So this is your short-term sell signal, and that was a, uh, a a sound sell signal in my view because you had one rally back up to the 10-day, and then you rolled over. But you're basically coming down into the 50-day, uh, and you can see the 65-day exponential, the the magic moving average just underneath there. Uh, but I think on a longer-term basis, you're probably looking at the 50-day moving average as the ultimate support level for Apple. So you definitely want to see how it acts when it pulls down to the 10-week or 50-day moving average. And so far, it looks like it picks up support support here. But the only problem I have is, at least near term, and it's not really a problem other than an argument that the stock probably needs more time. And what I would like to see happen here, 
and of course the market doesn't have to do what I would like to see it do, but I'd like to see the, the NASDAQ index decouple from Apple and you see Apple form a base as it really needs to and you see some other stocks as we have a rotational type correction and a move into, into some newer merchandise. Uh, see that decouple and see the NASDAQ be able to move higher as Apple continues to build a base and that would be something constructive I think uh, because in the next time Apple comes out I think that uh, you know, you got another leg coming up, but the thing is to really keep in mind with Apple, if you look at it on a weekly chart, for all the noise, that's what it looks like, you know. Uh, you're three weeks down in a base, and uh, you're holding the 10-week line, and you, that's just what it is. Here's your first stage base, and now you're coming down. This could just be the second stage base setting up uh, to go considerably higher uh, longer term, but in the near term, you know, what happened? Everybody thinks uh, it's a sure thing to go to a thousand. Everybody's got to own Apple. Now that they have a dividend, everybody's going to be buying it. And of course, the crowd is set up to be fooled uh, in the short term and get shaken out of the stock. I'm sure a lot of people got shaken out of stock in that last pullback because it was very scary. You know, very heavy volume. This thing's basically going uh, vertical straight to, to the downside. But, you know, what was really happening here is after this very sharp move, you've given up and held uh, most of your gains, and the other thing to keep in mind is it's very common for a leading stock to pull off 11, 12, 13 percent. And Dr. K, how far did Apple pull down off of its peak? In this recent pullback? Yeah, uh, let's see. There's a 13 percent. So we were, it was down 7.6 uh, percent. Maximum? Yeah. From 6.44 to down to 5.50, yeah. So oh, wait, are you, are you talking, yeah, you, well, this recent pullback was 7.6. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, you know, that's kind of a normal pullback. I mean, it looks like a lot of points, but it's just kind of a normal pullback. So nothing really, uh, you know, nothing really special there, uh, although it looks pretty scary when it happens. So, you know, see it build a new base. And somebody's asking, could I repeat the concept about the second leg of a bull market? Now, I'm just talking about myself, okay? Some people do real well uh, initially uh, in a bull market and uh, you know, make steady progress. I'll tend to be all over the place because... I tend to flounder around trying to find that big stock, and I've been in and out of things like LinkedIn. Uh, InventSense is one we played around with and barely got out of that one. You know, but that thing was pr pretty nasty pullback. I haven't seen a stock yank to the downside like that uh, after looking really strong. But you know, that's kind of the nature of this market. But that's just what happens. And in prior bull markets, a lot of times I'm down 20, 30 percent before. Uh, the second leg of the bull market, I suddenly jam 100 or more percent to the upside, and I and that's because the second stage bases are generally where a more accelerated move occurs, and of course that's intuitively uh, obvious to anybody who's been in the stock market because you'll notice things get parabolic, and they do so usually after the second stage base. So my point is that uh, a second stage uh, base or a second leg, the, mar the market coming up and out of a second uh, or actually its first correction here after a sharp move up since January, that could become a very profitable move if it materializes. So that's something you have to keep in mind uh, as you as you see, say, the first leg and if you were able to make 10, 15, 20 percent slogging it through, uh, you know, unless you had your whole account at Apple, which I know most people probably didn't, but uh, you know, if you're just logging through, then the second second leg is where you can really start to kick it up because most trends will start to accelerate. And so that's what I mean when I say the second leg, if and when it occurs, is generally much more profitable than the first leg up uh, in, in a bull market. And usually a bull market, a bull run will have uh, at least uh, two, some usually three legs. Is that right, Dr. K? Uh, typically, yeah. Yeah, so. But, you know, again, it's it's it's... I don't really look at that so so carefully, just because I, I just want to know day to day what what the stocks are telling me relative to the general right. market. And uh, <clears throat> has QE made distribution days less meaningful? It seems to me that when you see a confluence of of uh, distribution days and the market doesn't break, uh, you know, it's probably I don't know. I've seen that happen in other environments. I remember in 1997, I think it was late 1997, we were watching the market come down. And there were we were counting a ton of distribution days, and yet the stock would not break. And, and finally, O'Neill said to me, "That that means the market's probably bottom. It's probably going to turn and go higher from here." And uh, sure enough, it did. So you know, I don't know. I wouldn't really get hung up on whether QE causes this, that, or the other thing. The bottom line for me is, if the market gets a follow-through day, now I'm looking around and I'm looking for the stocks that have held up the best. 
and uh, you know they probably have broken out over the last few days or issued pocket pivots uh, and look uh, and look very strong, continue to act strong despite the market coming in. So somebody wants us to talk about MLNX. I don't know why. It's, I mean, is that a viable gap up? No, that's just a big move, isn't it? Oh, that's a weekly chart. Ah, okay. Yeah, we did. A, <clears throat> I sent a report on this one um, just because it's a it's a good lesson in, in viable gap ups. So uh, a, they, they should have they should have received that report in their email earlier today. Yeah. What does this thing trade? A couple hundred thousand shares a day. Yeah, yeah it trades like three hundred something thousand. I don't know. It's kind of thin. I don't really play <laughs> in the sandbox myself. I mean, you know, if you're asking about about this, here's the deal. If you want to play it as a viable gap up. You're right above the intraday low, so you could theoretically take a position here, and you got a pretty tight stop right there. Your thoughts, Dr. K? Yeah, that's exactly what the report was was about. Yeah, so, so you know, yeah. just everyone should just read the report, and uh, and they'll get the sense of how how they could have played this. Uh, would you consider Apple to still to be under distribution per the recent clump of red bars? Well, you know, if you go and study uh, stocks, big winners, you'll see that from time to time they come under very heavy selling. And the volume will look very big, and a lot of that is clearing the decks. But like we just pointed out, the correction in Apple is about seven percent. So really, there's not too much there uh, that looks all that deleterious. I mean, you do have a lot of pickup in volume, but it seems like people falling all over themselves. Plus, institutions they know that the crowd is sitting there loading up on the stock in the six twenty six thirty area because every goofball on TV. Uh, I just want to point it out I'm the only guy on TV who isn't a goofball. Um, <laughs> when I go on, but uh, <laughs> but you know everybody on TV when it's it's six twenty eight, six thirty, you know they're all saying, oh, you got to buy Apple, it's going to a thousand. Well, that sets up a short term move where the crowd thinks that oh, this is a sure thing. They all move in on that basis, and as soon as it shows them that it is not a sure thing, at least not in the near term, they all scamper uh, for the exits. And I think some of the institutions probably uh, smash the stock down too. You got to consider if you look at the sponsorship of Apple. There are some big funds like Contra Fund, Fidelity Contra Fund, where the position is over 10%. And uh, I know that uh, Will uh, Danoff, who runs the fund, that one of his trademarks is, you know, I remember he had, in 2004 he had a 10% position in Google, I, I recall. And he may run that for a while, but 10, you know, I don't know if it gets to 10, 15% if the stock continues higher, whether that necessitates uh, him reducing the position. And so you will have some institutions. Come in and just as a normal course of their operations in terms of their maximum position size that they that they are comfortable with, and 10% for any mutual fund is huge. Okay, so they can come in there and start knocking it down and just cutting their position down. But once they stop, then the stock stabilizes and it can uh, try and continue higher. And, and I would say with Apple, what you're looking at is a stock that probably will retest the 50-day, but I think the 50-day will be higher by then or starting to level off. And so you want to see how it acts coming in. I would be waiting for a pocket pivot if I wanted to come into the stock at any point down the line. Why is turnover so important, Dr. K? I think it just tells you how uh, how big the stock is and how much volume it trades, you know, and just what a massive uh, beast it has become. Dr. K? Yeah, it's a, that's a, not simple. In the case of Apple, <clears throat> it's an indication of turnover doubling from 50 times to 100 times, which is very telling. Yeah. Um, Apple did not violate its 10-week or its 50-day, I want to point out. I mean, you don't have a close. Here's your first close below the 50-day moving average here, and it never moved below the low of that. Now, if you're looking at the weekly chart, I don't really see how you can say that it violated uh, the 10-week because it never closed underneath it on a weekly basis. So. Unless this was just barely at it, where was this at? Closed? No, nope. it actually closed last week, right above the 50-day, and today and this week, it doesn't look like you're headed uh, below the 50-day, uh, at least not today. So, or at least not this week. And so, I, that's no violation there. So, is natural gas bottoming? I don't know. I'm not a natural gas guy, unless you feed me the wrong kind of foods. <clears throat> Why do you call the 65-day exponential moving average magic? Oh, that's kind of an inside joke. Um, it's just a moving average that I've used, and it, it's actually I know guys who trade commodities, and it's one that they use for commodities. So I actually started using that for uh, you know the metals, and I don't know. Sometimes you'll see stocks hold uh, that line, you know. You see Lulu bounces right off the 65-day exponential. But I know that I get emails from people telling me that, oh, you've got to use the 62-day moving average or the 
58-day moving average or the 53.79 moving average. And it's a, yeah, it doesn't say no moving average. There you go. A magic, right, a magic moving average. There is no magic moving average. I mean, if you want to create magic moving average, here's what you do. Draw 20 moving averages on your chart, okay? And I guarantee you that your stock will be finding support at some moving average somewhere every single day. So, you know, moving averages uh, in bulk can create a lot of comfort, but I don't know how useful they are. The way we operate with moving averages, and Dr. Tan and I are a little bit different. I like to use 65-day exponential, and I also throw on a 20-day because I've noticed some stocks <coughs> will actually follow uh, the 20-day moving average. And I remember back in the in the later 2000s, 2007, 2008, I used to use it, the pullback to the 20-day as a buy point or an ad point for a stock that was acting pretty well. Uh, and that was before Dr. K showed me all the work about the 10-day moving average. but you know, it's kind of neither here nor there. If you look at it, you might consider there's like a, a zone created by the two moving averages, and then there's another zone created by the 50 and the 65. And the way these work for me visually is that I see these as zones, and so I'm not so wedded to the idea that this is a you know line of demarcation. And if it goes below it, now I'm starting to think, oh my God, there's something wrong, because I just see the stock is falling into this zone, and a lot of stocks fall into these zones and they're okay. So that's kind of how I look at it. I don't know if anybody's familiar with uh, Ichimoku charts which uh, have all kinds of sh cool little shaded areas. I don't know, to me they're pretty meaningless and they don't really help me figure anything out, but you might consider this, you could color in these areas between the 50-day simple, 65-day exponential, and then between the 10-day and the 20-day simple, and they could be little Ichimoku cloud type things. So, um, I don't know, I call them Ichigomo uh, Itchy Gilmo charts, but anyways, somebody asked me about LQ, LKQX. Uh, you know, nice big move. That's a breakout. You want to buy it straight above the bottom. A little risky, but it looks pretty good. That's a thin stock. I know Ross uh, Haber likes has liked that stock. And he, if there's anybody psychologically outfitted to deal with volatile stocks, it's him. And so he's uh, he, he has tend to like. I think that's one of them. I don't know. Maybe it's, I'm thinking of another one. Ross, you can always pipe pipe up. Uh, I know you're probably in there somewhere. Um, yeah, here's one, another one that's pretty volatile. Or maybe it's that one. But in any case, LQKX, what, what do these guys do? Um, LKQX, sorry, there's my dyslexia showing up again. What do these guys do, Dr. K? They're doing uh, collision repair um, parts, uh, you know, mechanical, they operate a bunch of mechanical repair shops throughout the U.S. Retail, wholesale, auto parts. I think it's, from, man, I guess it's related to AutoZone, which you're getting, somebody asked about that, you're getting a little breakout here. Pocket pivot off the 10 day. I don't think they came out with earnings yet. Uh, I think O'Reilly is launching today as well. Uh, and, and what are the other ones here? AAP, uh, you know, try, this one's trying to come up. But all these stocks look to be in the same area, and it looks to me like uh, they are uh, moving together. So that's really good. Do I like them? I don't know. I mean, obviously, AutoZone's been a great stock, and there have been times when I've owned it. But it uh, looks like, I don't know, the second stage base. Here's a big first stage base. You come out, and here's your second stage breakdown. So, so there's a larger than three-year bull market and a shorter bull market since January 2012. Yes, I'm talking about the bull rally we started in January, okay? And see, if you consider, somebody's asking, you know, what, everybody wants to get into these questions about, you know, how long is the bull market? Is it too long? Is it too short? Is it just right, you know? I don't know, somebody called Goldilocks, maybe she can tell us. Uh, but you're looking at this 20% correction in the major market indexes here, and this could have washed everything out to set this up. Because you know how, see how volatile there, you get very coherent in here. Now you're finally having a, a serious correction. And I would say an intermediate correction, because I think the Russell 2000 and the Dow each have come down about 70%, so that qualifies there. Uh, I thought maybe you could see some catch-up on the downside in the NASDAQ and the S&P, and you did earlier this week, but now you're coming out of this, and so uh, and this could just be setting up for another leg. So, you know, like I said, I wouldn't make any assumptions about trying to figure out if you're in the third year or fourth year. Uh, you know, the 95 bull market started in January, and I think you had a couple of corrections in 96 and 97, but, you know, if you look at that, that was all just one big continuous bull market leading up into 1999. So there you had something that lasted four or five years, I think. And that was really, to me, one big uh, bull market with a couple of fast bear markets in it. So, um, you know, and that's what this looks like. I mean, this looks as bad as anything I've ever seen. Uh, so, you know, that's what I'm looking at. 
I mean, if you want to get into intellectualized arguments or intellectual arguments about you know the stage of the bull market and whether it's early or late or whatever, I, you know, to me that's just a waste of time. How do you decide which pocket pivots to send out to members? Well, we try to look at some of the better stocks that have better fundamentals. I know um, Cabs is it Cab? I think it's Cab. Cabela was one yesterday we saw, but we blew it off. Kind of a thinner, smaller stock, and they came out with earnings again hammered. The one thing I don't really care for is trying to buy stocks going into earnings. I think that's often problematic. I prefer to buy them after earnings. Um, Zag is just coming off off the lows, a little bit of a pocket pivot off the uh, 10 day. So, anyways, um, let's see, what do we got going here? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't really care for it. Doggy stock. Like I said, you want to buy things that are coming off the, off their lows like this. You know, there's a lot of overhead in here, so I, why waste your time? Uh, you know, just give me STX. Thank you very much. Drive through. Tango, Wango Tango. <clears throat> uh, I hate the stock, just so you know, which means it's probably going higher. But you know, you get these big moves in the stock, and then it gives it all up, comes back in. You got this weird. So I just would prefer not to play. Why do I need Tango? I'll take STX. Um, United Rentals, you guys see I have it up on my screen, so I have a little position in this. I had a nice pullback right into this uh, bottle <laughs> gap up, and it held, and you kind of be right back up. So a little bit of pullback in here, say 45 level, would be a really nice buy point, and if it comes down in there, uh, that's where I like it. I think this could be a sleeper stock and uh, continue higher. Uh, even though it seems like it's kind of boring, and I have to admit, you know, looking at it in this base, I would look at it. Yeah, that's a nice base, and then look at the the company, United Rent. It's like, oh my God, that's just too boring. I want it to be United Cloud Computing Social Networking Rentals. Then, then you'll get me excited, right? Tempur-Pedic is a dog. Don't want to play there. Why buy TQQQ? Giving that the F. Follow through day was on the SP 500 because the markets will all move together. Um, <clears throat> Baidu as a potential short. I said, like I said, not not trying to short anything right now. So it looks like a late stage failure. But you know, if you want to try it, go ahead. I just don't know if that's this is necessarily the time or the place for it. On the other hand, what you would look at, and you could put it on your list of uh, you know failing former leaders as something that would be. A short sale setup, but the one thing I want to point out is when you're looking at, let's consider this a big pod, and let's say it's failing here. A lot of times you'll have this break, and then it takes a period of time going sideways uh, before it finally breaks. You rarely see these things just dive straight off the failure, especially if it's a big stock like Baidu that has a wide institutional following. So I wouldn't be messing with it. VNTV doesn't really, you know, doesn't hit my radar screen. It's probably a little thin stock, so. Uh, not really one we're playing. So, Dunkin' Donuts. I don't know. It's it's again. You know, we talked about this. It's kind of cheesy. It's like Domino's Pizza. Everybody gets excited about that. They don't get me excited. So maybe they're as boring as United Rentals. So maybe they're all going to work. I don't know. But not really one we're playing. LinkedIn. I'm interested to see what LinkedIn does. I mean, it's basically in a range and just back and forth, back and forth. Not really trading heavy volume today. It needs to break out. And if you think about this in terms of you know where this thing is, big ugly pattern. Um, you know, I don't know. Some could argue if we went into a bear market, this is a pod formation. You know, it is very classic in that sense. And uh, I can make it look less uh, less ugly by doing this. So does that look better now? Much more constructive. But you do have a lot of upside volume. My guess is. I think they're going to gap up out of here on earnings. So I'm trying to decide when they come out with earnings what uh, I want to do. And I, I'm thinking I may take a small position going into earnings on this one because I think they're probably going to gap up. I think they're doing pretty well. I think this volume tells you that the stock is under accumulation. It tends, it, it, it now it's tested the 10 week, okay, and so that's caught up. And so you have a pretty reliable downside guide. This stock that will do everything it can to shake you out, you know, it runs up and then it comes back in, runs up, comes back in, it's very choppy. I'd like to see it tighten up. You know, on a weekly chart, what you have going on here is notice the closes up here are, are somewhat tight, even though you have, these, uh, you have these lower, long lower tails, and here you're having the same thing uh, occur. And so it looks like it's trying to set up to come out of here, but it's probably going to do it on a gap up move, and that's when it's, how it's going to go out. I mean, everybody's going to be sitting there with their finger up their nose, 
uh, not owning it, uh, I would be willing to probably take a 10 or 20 percent position going into earnings uh, because I think they are going to surprise. And I think all the prior accumulation tells you that the story is probably sound. But let's say if it breaks down, you know, 20 percent, I take a 10 percent position, it's going to cost me 2 percent overall damage. Or if I go 20 percent, it's going to cost me 4 percent on a 20 percent breakdown, which I would see as a maximum downside risk. And, you know, 4 percent, that's just a daily wiggle for me, so I don't really that that's totally doable, and if I can get a head start on a, a gap up that say goes to 120 on earnings, if that would occur, then I would I would definitely consider that risk doable for me. Somebody else may not want that; they would rather wait wait for a, a gap up. And you know, if you think about it, if this is really going to be uh, Apple's for, or not Apple, but LinkedIn's first uh, real base, you know, since coming public, and it just comes out, you're just starting to come out, and it's, it's very new in the move or early in the move, so really wouldn't worry about it. Um, somebody's mentioning pocket pips and SPH. I, I went, like I said, I won't waste my time with that. GNC, we told you guys yesterday is a viable gap up. Uh, today it's holding the gap up, but it's you know inside day so far. If it comes out 38, I guess you can buy it, but we mentioned it back here and it's held that, that uh, low all the way up. It held the 50 day here as well on the pullback, so it looks fine. <clears throat> I want to get through some more questions here. GLD, we're going to get to this. Uh, gold looks to me, I mean, this is a pocket pivot yesterday, but it's below the 10-day moving average, which in turn is below the 50-day moving average, which is in, in turn is below the 200-day moving average. You could even say this is a black cross with the 50-day dropping below the 200-day moving average, and so this is terrible. But uh, I think gold is trying to... Um, to hit a bottom in here, and I think that uh, with QE uh, still in the background, you're seeing today, where's gold? Gold is up 16 bucks on the futures, uh, and it's moving up, and I think you may be hitting a bottom, but we're going to wait and, and uh, until we see some sort of a uh, movement, uh, I think, uh, up to the 50-day. Now, one thing you might notice is I'm showing you the nearest futures contract, and you see one thing for fun. This actually would be a pocket pivot coming up now through the 10-day moving average on the gold future. So, I don't know. Would you buy gold here, Dr. K? What's your thought? Well, not not in terms of um, my time frame. My time frame is to capture gold when it breaks out of its base. And if you look at the weekly on gold going back 11 years, you'll see that when it goes, when it go, breaks out of a, a well-formed base, it goes on a nice uptrend. Um, some are longer than others, but you just have to have patience with this one. And, uh, you know, for me, even if it ran up through the 50-day, I, I would still not be a buyer. I'd just wait for the basing pattern to complete on the weekly chart, and then I would get in. And same with silver. And buy the breakout. Yeah, because if it starts a new leg uh, up and it breaks out of this base, history shows, or, or its prior history over the last 10 years, shows that when it does finally clear a base, it's off and running, and so that's really where you want to really want to come into it. So is the gap down in Yuri uh, a concern for you? Well, I own the stocks. So I guess it's not, huh? What I see this as is a shakeout and a breakout. So you basically shake out here and then you break out. So uh, I'm not really worried about. I see that as a sign of strength, particularly since this breakout I think negates uh, this gap up here comes on much more volume than this gap down here. And I don't even think that's the gap down. I think that's basically coming off. Uh, well, am I getting that right? That is. This move here, so that's not even the gap. So this is the gap here, and that doesn't occur on heavy volume. And then it moves down, scares everybody out, and then it sets up again, turns around, and goes uh, goes out to new highs. So to me, that's a shakeout and a breakout. So it doesn't really concern me, you know. You say you take a 10% position, and and if it comes down 20%, you're only losing 2%. You're losing 2% overall to your portfolio. So if stock is one-tenth of your portfolio and that one-tenth of your portfolio drops 20%, what is one-tenth of 20%? 2%. So you're figuring it in terms of overall damage to your portfolio. Is that DBOL, DBOL, no, DBOL fund? How does it look to me? I don't know. I'm not really an oil guy. It looks like it's basing and it's on top of the other base. I don't, can't tell you if it's going higher. So. Inverted head and shoulders on gold. A lot of people will say that. You know, if you look at the GLD, for example, uh, here's your, you know, upside down or inverted head and shoulders, reverse head and shoulders is considered a bullish pattern, I suppose. And uh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But like Dr. K said, 
he'll just wait for the base breakout, and that'll be when you come up probably through these levels. What, where would you say the breakout point is, Dr. K, right here at these highs? Like one yeah, I would I would say if if it can clear that midpoint, um, you know, above I'd say above one seventy five. Okay. Uh, I would be very uh, interested in just to see how the price volume acts leading up to that uh, to that price point. That'd be very interesting. Yeah. Now notice you can notice on the weekly chart here. Uh, I'll make this a little bigger. You notice that it's now actually holding along these lows, and uh, you know, volume overall is kind of drying up. So I don't know if this is a this is stabilizing here, and you're seeing accumulation because you don't really see that anywhere else in here. A lot of these are very V-shaped. On these two lows here are V-shaped, and so you know maybe it is starting to set up. But as as always, everybody wants to buy something cheap rather than buying it when it breaks out and catching the big move, uh, and that's kind of what we're waiting for. So. Uh, you're welcome. Whoever that is thanking us for answering their questions. I'm going to answer a couple of more questions. We actually have a conference call at 10 a.m. Pacific time uh, to go over the uh, well. What essentially is now the completed manuscript for the for the most part, right, Dr. K? I mean, there's only the FAQ chapter, which may or may not be an extra chapter. Right. Um, for the We're most pretty part, much. Yeah, we pretty much have the draft done. Yeah, whew, finally. That, uh, it's, that's a lot of work, but you know, I don't think there's any other two guys on the planet who can write 350 pages on the market uh, the way we can. <laughs> either we're either we're effluvient BSers, or uh, we we maybe have something to say. But as I've pointed out before in the new book, what we really tried to do was we took the the material from the old book has generated you know a lot of questions, and of course we have the website. And there's a tremendous amount of, say, nuance regarding a lot of the techniques that we use. And I think that it's helpful to go back over the material. And we basically only covered the long side. We didn't cover the short side. That will be the next book. We're going to probably, or we, well, let me just say that we're thinking about working on a, a new book uh, on the short side. Because there's a lot of different new techniques that we've come up with. Um, and I think you come out with a short selling book in a bull market because you want people to have it and be ready for the bear market. Um, and uh, I remember that when we started, when they told me to start working on the new short selling book or the short selling book that I wrote with Bill O'Neill, I think that was in 2003. And as early 2003, I believe, and the market was still kind of sloppy because, you know, they thought, oh, we'll do a short selling book and that will sell real well. Uh, and that turned out to be the bottom of the market, of course. And uh, and I think that's the same thing is, is uh, the case when people want to uh, uh, get into buying a short selling book that, that tells you and, and tells you where you are. And what I think is interesting is that I'm seeing a lot of questions and I've never seen so many questions about shorting this, shorting that. You know, is CRM a pod? Um, I don't know. I mean, it is if it breaks down, but it's not. it hasn't broken down to its 50 day. It's had a sharp run up and it found support at the 50 day. So, you know, just be careful. Everything, you want to short everything right now. I think that tells you the market's probably going to go higher first. Um, I'm going to answer some of these questions on lumber liquidators. I noticed this this morning. Nice uh, gap up. Very choppy, sloppy pattern, but I noticed you got that coming back and I noticed Ryland also gapping up, and you know that may be constructive uh, for housing and hence for the market and underlying conditions. But again, I'm I'm more interested in some of the more uh, liquid, not lumber liquidators. That's not a liquid stock, even though liquid is in the name. But uh, I'm more interested in more liquid leaders that are in, in better positions in their patterns. So not really something I'm uh, interested in playing. Baidu dropped 14% after earnings during aftermarket two days ago, but then recovered all the way back. What is going on in a stock like that? Well, like I said, it's a big leader, and uh, it comes down enough. You have institutions come in and step step up and support it. So that seems to be all the questions we have. If anybody's got any last-minute stuff, get it in now. Um, <clears throat> DDD is one that everybody seems to be asking about. I don't, you know, there's nothing I can tell you on this. You had a breakout here, and it's holding along the 10-day line, so it's acting okay. Uh, and it's got this big pattern it's trying to come out of. So you know, this may need to form a base, and then come. I'd like to see it come out of this big pattern eventually. So, uh, in any case, as I was saying about the new book, what, what we've done is take a, a lot of the questions. We've gained the insight into what it is that puzzles people about pocket pivots, Bible gap ups, the uh, seven-week rule, using moving averages, and so on. And try to make it more of a hands-on, uh, real-time with uh, trading simulations and with 
numerous numerous examples and forcing the reader to exercise their own judgment and figuring out pocket pivots, viable gap ups, and so on, and and hopefully helping along with the process uh, that we think is very important, whereby with somebody uh, you study a lot of examples of stocks and of viable gap ups of pocket pivots, and you start to get a sense of how these things can often act and you develop some judgment that way. So that's one thing we try to address. Um, the, the thing with that is that when you start going through trading simulations, when you start going through exercises, you can do a hundred exercises, but you could do a hundred more when you're done with that. So I don't know, maybe the next there'll be another version with even more uh, exercises like that. But in any case, that's kind of where we're coming from with that new book. But th that's really all we have here. Things are developing very slowly. Um, the book will come out, it's in the fall lineup, so probably in the late summer. Um, oh, one last uh, uh, REGN, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. I think this is, uh, you know, it's a viable gap up. It's at the low of the day, so I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't really like buying this sort of viable gap. It's very extended, had a long run. You can see the last time I had a viable gap up like that, that failed. So I'm not so hot on it, and it's definitely not one that we've talked about. So Rax and MNST, please. Um, I don't know. Rax is holding the 65-day exponential, but notice it didn't violate the 50-day moving average. So I'm not really a buyer of that. Tractor Supply, you know, they gapped up when they said earnings were going to be great, and earnings come out and they're just flopping around. But you know, it's not really violating the 10-day or anything. It's trying to hold in there. So, but you know, just watch how a lot of these stocks. Uh, the book will not be online, but it will be an ebook with an enhanced ebook edition. Oh, in Vansance, everybody wants to know about that. What are my thoughts? I'm not a buyer of it. It's low in its pattern. Uh, it looks gnarly. Uh, it looks like you know this is almost head and shoulders with the descending neckline now. And I think I told you guys last week that I thought it probably would rally. So you could try and play a trade trade up to the 50-day if you're a bottom fisher, but I really think this ends up being a right shoulder. If this is going to set up in the new base, it takes going to need a lot of time to heal up. So that's my uh, my take on it, and I'm not a buyer of Invencence at all. So RGR, um, I don't know. I, I, it's just it's going higher, so it looks okay. I think Smith and Wesson is that no? What is Smith and Wesson, Dr. K? What's the symbol? Oh, you got me, actually. Yeah, I don't know. The gun stock's been acting well, and, and uh, this has been going on for a while. There's a Bible gap up here. It's held. It's volatile, and it's just going to new highs. I can't tell you to sell it. INVN has earnings sign. Okay, thanks for that, Dave. Um, so, anyways, we got to get on our conference call. It's now 10 o'clock. Dr. K, you want to get on? i got a couple things i got to do. Yeah, I actually have a couple things because I've, I've been really, uh, you know, we're just going to have to get on a little late. All right, well... Uh, we'll let them know. But anyways, right that's now, really all time. we can do right now. There's, I'm, thank I'm you. There's, on, I'm going to get on in about. Uh, I need to get a couple things done. I should be on in about five minutes. All right. Same here. All right. Anyway, that's all we got for now, everybody. Uh, if you have any questions, just send them in to uh, info at uh, virtueofselfinvesting.com, and we'll try to get back to you. If we didn't cover anything, I'll recover your questions in this uh, session. But we've gone for a whole hour, and unfortunately, we have to run off to a. Uh, conference call with the Wiley people. So thanks for showing up, you guys. We'll catch you next time. Take care. Hello, everyone. The organizer has ended the session.